Okay, thank you, David and Sue, and thank you all for spending your Valentine's evening with me to learn about volcanic gases. So I'm gonna talk about volcanic gases this evening and how we use them to monitor volcanoes and forecast eruptions. So my research is motivated by the fact that volcanic gases provide messages about conditions within a volcano's subsurface. And this is through both their chemical composition and their flux. And these messages can be decoded to help forecast eruptions and estimate the relative explosivity of an impending eruption. This is important here in Alaska because we have over 52 historically active volcanoes spreading all the way from Wrangell in the east all the way to Boulder in the west. This is about 1,800 miles, so this is a big area that we're covering. Of these volcanoes, um, we have about two eruptions on average per year, and in 2016, we had three volcanoes that have been erupting, or that erupted, Cleveland, Bogoslav, which is still erupting, and Pavlov. Within Alaska, the biggest hazard we have from volcanic eruptions is from ash, and this is both from ash fall on local communities, as well as the hazards of ash on our aviation traffic. There's about 50,000 passengers per day that pass over the North Pacific. Um, and this photo is not from Alaska, this is following the Mount Pinatubo eruption, and this just shows the density and high mass of ash deposited on this airplane that caused it to tip over. We've had similar volcanic hazards in Alaska. Um, some of you might remember in 1989, we had the eruption of Redoubt Volcano. There was a KLM Jet 867 that actually intersected the ash cloud. That ash melted in the turbine jets, and that plane fell, uh, I think 14,000 feet before the pilot was able to restart all four engines. So all the passengers and crew were all safe, but this was a big wake up call to those of us in Alaska studying volcanoes that this is a hazard that we need to be aware of. And this is a photograph uh, by my colleague Tina Neal. This is a windshield from that actual plane. And those of you in the front may be able to see that it's quite abraded. It would be difficult to see through this. And that's just simply from the ash um, intersecting that windshield. Okay, so as David mentioned, I'm part of the Alaska Volcano Observatory. We are tasked with monitoring volcanoes within Alaska and notifying our agency partners if there is unrest at a volcano that might produce a hazard. Uh, our organization is made up of three different groups, including the U.S. Geological Survey, based in Anchorage, uh, the UAF Geophysical Institute, which is where I work, and the Alaska Division of Geological and Geophysical Surveys. Together, we monitor all of Alaska's volcanoes using a variety of techniques, including seismicity, remote sensing, infrasound, deformation, lightning, petrology, geology, and finally, volcanic gases, and that's what I'm gonna talk about this evening. Okay, so this is an outline of what I'm gonna be talking about tonight. So through my presentation, I'll describe the important role of volcanic gases in driving volcanism. I'll discuss how volcanic gases provide messages about a volcano's interior that we can decode. I'll illustrate how we collect volcanic gas samples and measurements in the field and some of the challenges we experience here in Alaska. And lastly, I'll provide some examples um, on how we've used or are currently using volcanic gas data from our volcanoes to understand the plumbing system of Alaskan volcanoes. And before I go any further, I'm gonna define some terminology so we're all on the same page. Um, volatile is the first word I wanna define. This is any molecule that prefers to be in the gas phase at standard temperature and pressure. Uh, so if there's a volcanic gas released at the Earth's surface, that's a gas, but if it's in the subsurface, that I would call that a volatile. A fumarole is a small vent at a, volcanic, a volcano surface where volcanic gases are released. This is where we sample the gases. Uh, gas flux and emission rate, I use these relatively interchangeably. They both mean the amount of gas emitted by a volcano over unit time. And then lastly, magma and lava both mean molten rock, where magma is within the subsurface of the volcano and lava is erupted at the volcano's surface. Okay, so I'm gonna go over some uh, geology to talk about how volcanoes form and why volcanic gases are important. So if any of you were at Carl Tape's talk a few weeks ago, you already learned a little bit about plate tectonics. This is a review. Um, so plate tectonics is a theory that the Earth's crust is made up of uh, multiple moving plates, eight. And here you can see that Alaska is present on the North American plate. At each, or sorry, this is a cross section of the Earth. And you can see that the, the crust is a very thin layer overriding the upper mantle. 
So the combined upper mantle and crust makes up what we call the lithosphere, and this is a rigid plate that moves on top of the molten mantle asthenosphere. And this movement can lead to different types of processes. So at the plate boundaries, there's three different types of motion that can occur. So a transform fault is similar to what we have in San Andreas, California. This is where we have two plates moving past each other. Um, in Iceland, at, at rift volcanoes, we have two plates moving away from each other. This is a divergent plate mount boundary. And in Alaska, we have convergent plate boundaries. This is where two plates are moving towards each other. So if we go back to this figure, here we have the lithosphere subducting into a mantle wedge. And if we have two plates pulling apart here, we get mantle upwelling that produces volcanism along the oceanic spreading center. And if we have the subducting lithosphere beneath continental or oceanic crust, we get arc volcanism. And that's what we have in Alaska. So how exactly does this work? Well, it's all because of volatiles. So if we consider our subduction zone setting, we have this oceanic crust. You can imagine that the layer of the oceanic crust, um, the bottom of the oceanic floor, sorry, there's sediments that are water rich. These water rich sediments are trapped in the oceanic crust and then that gets subducted into the subduction zone. A flux, we're able to compare emissions from our volcano over time and we're also able to compare emissions from our volcano to another volcano. So now I'll describe how we actually use these. Okay, so the gas composition messages can help answer three questions. The first is, is magma present? The second, how deep is the magma? And third, is there shallow water in the subsurface? Um, this is a figure I compiled using data from a study by Gerlach et al. This shows the average gas composition from all the arc volcanoes around the world. And as you see, the composition is almost entirely made up of water. It's about over 90% of all volcanic gases released is our water. The second most abundant is carbon dioxide, CO2. And the third most abundant is sulfur dioxide, SO2. The proportion of these volatiles can change depending on different shallow and deep processes. So the biggest deep controlling factor that affects gas composition um, is decompression, how deep the magma is. So if we consider our magma at depth, we have volatiles that are dissolved deep within the crust. As that magma ascends and pressure decreases, those volatiles are able to dissolve to, so to form a separate gas phase. And this is similar to if we open a bottle of Coke that's under pressure, we release the pressure, and then the CO2 is able to form a bubble and then rise through the fluid. So this is essentially the same thing that happens at a volcano. Once the gases are exolved, they can ascend to the Earth's surface, um, either by rising through the magma due to their lower density, or by ascending through a fracture network to reach the Earth's surface. And once they're at the Earth's surface, we can measure them. Okay, so the composition of gases is controlled, or when the gases exolve, is controlled by their solubility. Um, this is essentially a measure of how easily the gas wants to be dissolved in the magma. And the most insoluble gas of the major volcanic gas species I mentioned is CO2. So this does not like to be in magma, it like, or in melt. It likes to exolve to form a separate bubble phase and then can ascend to the Earth's surface. So if we have a deep magma, it's, it's going to produce a CO2 rich gas. Then as that magma ascends to mid to shallow crustal depths, sulfur species are the next to exolve. As that magma ascends even further into the shallow crust, water will begin to exolve. And lastly, once that magma is near the Earth's surface, the halogen species, hydrogen chloride and hydrogen fluoride, will be begin to exolve. So if we are measuring the composition of gases over time, we can look for this trend to get an idea if magma is ascending. Sometimes we're not able to get a full time series, but we might have sporadic measurements over time. So for example, if we have a gas measurement at a moment in time and we observe a high ratio of an insoluble to soluble gas, such as CO2 to water and SO2 to HCl, that might indicate that we have a deep volatile rich magma source. In contrast, if we observe a low ratio of an insoluble to soluble gas, such as CO2 to water and SO2 to HCl, that would indicate that we have a shallow magma. So we can get relative ideas of magma degassing depth by looking at the gas composition. Um, here's an example from some data I collected from Bezmiani Volcano in Kamchatka, Russia. This was part of my PhD, and this illustrates um, this gas composition. 
So on the left-hand side is the gas composition I measured in 2007. As you notice, the composition is almost entirely made up of water with small quantities of carbon dioxide and uh, hydrogen chloride. So this gas composition, based on the solubility trends I just described, suggests that we have a shallow magma body. It's notable that we collected the sample two months following an eruption. So an eruption where lava was erupted at the Earth's surface, so it's consistent with our gas composition observations. On the right-hand side, we have a composition that has significant quantities of water, but also a large proportion of carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide. So this composition we observed in 2009, um, and it's suggestive of a deep magma source. It's notable that this composition was measured five months before we had a volcanic eruption. So in this case, by measuring the gas composition and seeing the trend and how different the composition was from in 2007, we had an idea that we likely had deep magma ascending at Besamiani. And so this we can use to help forecast eruptions. Okay, so now I'm gonna talk about how we use flux uh, information uh, to learn about subsurface of a volcanic. So the questions that SO2 fluxes can help answer include how much magma is ascending, is the vent open or closed, and is there shallow water scrubbing sulfur dioxide? And all of these are important for eruption forecasting and volcano monitoring. So I'm gonna describe them in more detail. So we can think about all volatiles or all volcanic gases as being proportional to the quantity of magma they exolved from. So if we observe a high SO2 flux, sorry, on the right hand side, that would be consistent with having a large quantity of magma. In contrast, if we observe a low SO2 flux, that might be indicative of a small quantity of magma. And to give you an idea of what I mean by these large and small quantities, an SO2 flux um, or my colleague Cindy Warner from the USGS compiled data on SO2 fluxes from Alaskan volcanoes. And she observed that for volcanoes that during periods of quiescence, they released less than about 100 tons per day of SO2. Volcanoes during unrest release between about 100 and 1,000 tons per day SO2, and volcanoes undergoing eruption uh, release of over 1,000 tons per day SO2. So we can use these as guidelines to get an idea of the activity at the volcano. Okay, I also mentioned that we can use SO2 flux measurements to tell us if the volcanic vent is open or closed. So if we observe a high SO2 flux or an increasing flux, that would indicate that we have an open vent and it likely indicates that we have magma ascending from depth. So this is an important eruption precursor. Alternatively, if we had an SO2 flux and that drops, so we have a decreasing SO2 flux, that could indicate that our vent is sealing. So this can happen if we have uh, lava within the conduit that crystallizes. And what happens in this case is that the gases are still being released from the ascending magma at depth, but they're not able to be released at the Earth's surface. So that gas pressure builds up in the volcanic edifice Ultimately, the uh, gas pressure exceeds the confining pressure and we have an explosive eruption. So if we see this trend, we might uh, be thinking that there might be an eruption coming. So this again is an important eruption precursor. One example of this is from Cleveland Volcano. This is one of our central Aleutian volcanoes. Here's a photograph taken in 2015, looking down on the volcanic crater and you can see this pancake-shaped lava dome. Also note that there's no gases being released at this time. While there was no gas measurements being conducted, the fact that there's no visible emissions suggests that we probably had a low SO2 flux. In contrast, this past summer, I took this photo, again looking down in the crater of Cleveland, and you can see here is the pancake-shaped lava dome, and here there's a hole. You can't tell in this photograph, but when I was looking down, you could see incandescent material uh, within that hole, suggesting that this is an open vent. Um, and the SO2 flux that we measured at that time was about 300 tons per day, consistent with a volcano during unrest. Uh, what's interesting is that two days after this photo was taken, Cleveland had an eruption. So our interpretation is that we had vent sealing in Cleveland, we had gas pressure building on, in the volcanic edifice, when it exceeded the confining pressure, it triggered an explosive eruption. So actually at Cleveland now, we use the presence of a lava dome uh, to elevate our color code uh, to pay attention more closely to this volcano because we might expect an eruption to be coming.
Okay, so I've talked to you about the messages that can be provided by gas fluxes and gas composition, but it's not as simple as I first implied. Some of these messages can be modified in route to the surface by shallow crustal processes. And the main process that affects our volcanoes is hydrothermal scrubbing. And what this is, is this is where we have liquid water within the volcanic edifice that removes acid gases from the gas phase. So sulfur dioxide and hydrogen chloride are acid gases. They're highly soluble in water. So as those gases are ascending from the volcano, as they intersect a liquid water, they'll be removed from the gas phase. And if we're making measurements at the Earth's surface, what we'll observe is a gas composition dominated by CO2, water, and hydrogen sulfide. So no SO2 or HCl present. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so this is important for interpreting our data. So shallow water is important for a couple reasons. First, it modifies our gas composition, but also uh, the presence of shallow water could be an, a hazard because if magma intersects shallow water, that water can flash to steam, which is causes a huge volume expansion and large, very explosive eruptions. Um, these eruptions are called phreatic eruptions. These eruptions are notoriously difficult to forecast and therefore quite hazardous. There was a example a couple years ago in Japan where there was many backpackers on a volcano that underwent phreatic eruption and many of those people died. So this is something we're concerned about um, as we monitor volcanoes. Okay, so now I just wanted to give a little review. So say we're measuring gases at some Alaskan volcanoes and we observe a high or increasing SO2 flux, that's the coded message, and we want to decode it. So the question is, what can this gas signal mean? So there's two options that I've talked about. One is that we have magma recharge or ascent, so new magma entering the system. And the second is drying out of a hydrothermal system. So in, in both cases, we have magma ascending from depth, which is an eruption precursor. If we have shallow magma, we might have an eruption. So these are trends that we want to look for, and these are the messages we might interpret from these observations. A second example is if we have a low or decreasing SO2 flux. So this can indicate, again, several different scenarios, some of which are more hazardous than others. The first example is simply we have no new magma. In this case, we're not concerned about the volcano. Um, we don't have to pay as close attention to it. <coughs> the second option is that we have hydrothermal scrubbing. So we might have new magma entering the system, but there's enough water that it's removing the SO2 from the gas phase, so we're not detecting it at the surface. So this is something we're concerned about because this could be a precursor or this could be conditions prior to a highly explosive phreatic eruption. And then the last option, is, again, is conduit sealing. This is where we have some, something blocking the vent, closing the vent, preventing gas release. And as I described earlier, giving the Cleveland example, this is also a precursor to eruption. So when we make these observations, we need to consider what we know about the individual volcanoes, what their behavior is shown in the past, and we can also compare our data to complementary data sets to help get to the bottom of which interpretation is the most accurate for our volcano of interest. Okay, so now you know how we use gas data to forecast and monitor volcanoes. Now I'm gonna talk about how we actually collect these measurements. So there's three options that I use, direct sampling, in situ plume measurements, and ground-based remote sensing. So direct sampling is the most traditional way that we measure volcanic gases, and it simply involves taking an evacuated bottle to the volcano where the gases are released and collecting that gas in the bottle. We then bring the bottle back to the lab and analyze it for its composition. Um, the advantages of this technique is that we get complete chemical information on the gas composition, which is great. The disadvantages is that Often it involves being in unsafe sampling location. Usually we're in the crater rim of an active volcano where we have hazards such as rock falls um, and also volcanic activity. Uh, the second disadvantage of this technique is that it's an unhealthy environment. We're breathing toxic gases. We wear respirators, but still it's a concern. You don't want to spend too much time in these environments. And then the last disadvantage is that because we're collecting one measurement at one location at one moment in time, it might not be representative of the entire volcano. Uh, it might not represent the bulk plume. So we might be getting a biased uh, sample. Okay, the next type of measurement we use is in situ plume measurements. 
And the instrument we use is called a multi-gas, multiple gas analyzer system. And this is essentially a box that contains different uh, sensors to measure different gas concentrations. We can deploy this instrument on the crater rim of a volcano, and it's able to collect gas measurements uh, nearly continuously. So in this case, we were able to collect measurements for 30-minute periods four times a day. And we can, this can run for months to years. So the advantages of this technique is that because it's measuring the bulk plume composition, uh, we're getting a more representative uh, sampling of the volcanic emissions. The disadvantage is that it's relatively costly both to install and maintain. And we do actually have one of these instruments, a permanent instrument, currently operating on Augustine Volcano, which is pretty exciting. Okay, and now I'll go into remote sensing and how we use remote sensing to quantify volcanic emissions. So I'm going to focus on sulfur dioxide, and that's simply because in background air, SO2 is very low, unless you're in a polluted environment. Uh, this is in contrast to the other main volcanic gases, CO2 and water, which have really high concentrations in ambient air, making them difficult, difficult to distinguish volcanic CO2 and water. Okay, so each molecule absorbs and emits radiation in a unique manner based on its molecular structure. This is the molecular structure of sulfur dioxide, and because of this unique structure, it absorbs light uniquely, and that's referred to as its absorption cross-section. So this is a, a figure showing the absorption cross-section of SO2 on the y-axis, and this is wavelength from about 300 to 320 nanometers. This is within the ultraviolet region of the electromagnetic spectrum, and this curve is very distinctive of SO2. So if we measure light in the atmosphere and we see this absorption signal, we know that we have SO2 present. So how do we apply this at a volcano? We can bring a spectrometer, uh, I use one called a fly spec, and if I collect a measurement of light scattered UV radiation from the sun, so blue sky, if I collect a measurement of that sky looking through my volcanic plume, that will be my intensity I value, and then if I collect a second value outside of the plume, just of scattered, scattered sunlight that hasn't been absorbed by the plume, that will be my I naught value. I can plug that into the beer lambert bouguet equation and solve for the concentration of SO2 over the path length L. And that's essentially how many SO2 molecules are in this with the thickness of plume. So that's how we measure SO2 absorption. And then the next step is we actually want the SO2 flux. So how much SO2 is released over time? So how we do that is we collect a series of these SO2 absorption measurements across the plume. Um, that'll, we'll get a signal that looks like this, where SO2 column density is on the x-axis, plume width is on the y-axis, and we calculate the area under the curve. We multiply that by the plume speed, how fast the plume is traveling, and that gives us the flux in units of tons per day or kilograms per second. Okay, so what are the advantages of remote sensing? Uh, the first is that we're able to obtain SO2 flux at high temporal resolution and from a safe distance. This is a photograph of me taken at Cleveland Volcano. Here's the volcano, here's me. I'm about five kilometers away. So I feel safe, even though this is an active volcano that erupts frequently, I feel safe collecting my measurements here. The disadvantage is that, as I mentioned earlier, we're only able uh, to measure SO2, at least with this technique I described. So we don't have constraints on gas composition, only gas flux. Um, and also, as I mentioned earlier, uh, while each technique and measuring composition and flux each have their advantages and disadvantages, what's really the best scenario is if we can combine our gas composition and flux measurements with other data sets at a volcano of interest. So that includes seismicity or ground motion, deformation, is the volcano inflating or deflating, petrology, what's the composition of the erupted lavas, remote sensing uh, of plumes or uh, hot thermal emissions, an infrasound, this is low frequency sound wave produced usually during an explosion or high velocity uh, degassing. So these techniques combined with ours give us the best information to monitor volcanoes. Okay, so what are the challenges and opportunities of working in Alaska? All of you that live here, you know Alaska is unique. The biggest challenge, or one of the biggest challenges we have is access. I showed this map earlier, but we have volcanoes extending over a huge region. It's difficult to get to these volcanoes, and it's expensive. Also, once we get there, the terrain is difficult. 
So we either have to hike up the volcano with all of our equipment, or we need to take a helicopter, which again is costly. Um, the other significant challenge we have is weather. As you know, the weather can change very quickly, and we can get extreme weather here. So I'm going to give you an example of some of the weather we can experience in Alaska. So this photograph was taken in July of 2013 on the crater rim of Mount McGeek. This is the installation of the multi-gas instrument I mentioned earlier. We had blue sky conditions, and we were installing this instrument in t-shirts, so it was a lovely day. Then, less than two weeks later, on September 24th, we went to retrieve the instrument. And the first thing I want you to note, notice is that the box is open. When we left this, the box was closed and locked. So there must have been enough freezing and thawing or strong winds to actually break the lock, open the cover of the box, and then accumulate between five inches to a foot of rime ice all over our instrument. So these are some of the challenges we have to deal with. Um, then following that, I had another interesting experience. Does anyone know what this is? If you've seen this photograph, please don't shout. But has anyone not seen this photograph and knows what this object is? OK, this is a helicopter. This is what happened when we went to pull that instrument out. The weather changed quickly. Fog came in. We weren't able to take off from the helicopter. And as we were sitting there, ice accumulated on the rotor blades until eventually there was so much ice that we weren't able to take off. We thought we would just spend the night, but we actually ended up spending two nights. This is what our helicopter looked like after two days. You can barely recognize it. And that night, we were able to get rescued by the Air National Guard. And later that week, the pilot was able to retrieve the helicopter, and it was OK. But this is what can happen in Alaska. Alternatively, on the other end of the spectrum, this is what can happen. I took this photograph almost two years to the anniversary of when I got stuck on Mount McGeek. Uh, west of Adak in the Bering Sea. This is Kanaga Volcano. We're cruising west on the maritime-made research vessel, and we had glassy seas and a beautiful sunset. So these are some of the rewarding aspects of working at these remote locations in Alaska. And now I'm going to show you a video. Uh, this is a video my colleague Tobias Fisher and I made of our uh, e expedition to the Western Aleutians, and it shows how we collect gas measurements in the field. The Western Aleutians represent one of the most remote areas of the world. Because of this, the volcanoes in this island chain remain poorly studied. An expedition to this remote region was launched in September 2015, with funding from the U.S. National Science Foundation, with additional support from the U.S. Geological Survey and the Deep Carbon Observatory. The goals of the expedition included investigating of how Earth's crust forms, how magma composition and volatile content affect eruptive activity, and how much volcanic carbon is emitted to the atmosphere. To study the gases emitted from volcanoes requires sampling of the fumaroles. There is no easy access into the active crater of Garilloy. We decided to climb down into the crater over very slippery tephra layers on top of old snow and ice. It took us several hours to reach the fumaroles. When we finally got there, I started collecting altered rock samples from this pristine and extreme environment for microbiological analyses. Deep Carbon Observatory Deep Life scientists are currently analyzing these samples. They're interested in finding out what kinds of organisms thrive in acidic, high temperature environments adjacent to fumaroles. The heat of the gases emitted from these fumaroles reached 350 degrees centigrade. Kiska was the westernmost active volcano that we collected gas samples from. Its emissions came from a single huge fumarolic vent covered in native sulfur. The gas emissions sound like jet engines, and descending into the big vent seemed way too dangerous given our remote location. Another target we visited was Kanaga Volcano, 
which has an extremely steep edifice, requiring the helicopter to land right on the summit. Dan, our very skilled pilot, was able to drop us right next to the approximately 15 meter wide fissure that opened up during the 2012 eruption. Here I am sampling some of the low temperature gases from this fissure while Taryn collects plume samples for CO2 content and carbon isotope analyses. After sampling these gases and collecting plume samples, we analyze them on board of the Maritime Made using a thermoscientific delta ray isotope analyzer. Obtaining results while still in the field allowed us to adjust our sampling protocols in real time. Okay, so that gives you an idea of what it's like to measure gases in Alaska. So now I'm going to go through and give examples on some of the data we've collected and interpretations we've made. So I'm going to start with the Western Aleutian. So you just saw how we collected some of those measurements. And I'm going to present results from Little Sitkin, Garaloy, and Kanaga. So most of Little Sitkin's activity is uh, persistent hydrothermal and fumarolic activity. It's had no confirmed historic eruptions with one possible eruption in 1900. Um, it also had a period of seismic unrest in 2012 that was interpreted to be due to magma intrusion. So when we were at Little Sitkin, we were not able to measure sulfur dioxide. So our interpretation of this is that there was hydrothermal scrubbing of the magmatic gas. And now I'm going to go through the gas composition. But before that, I'm going to show uh, what, I, what we call ternary diagrams. This is how volcanic gas geochemists usually plot up gas composition and make interpretations. So you can see two ternary diagrams. They're just triangles where we're plotting the normalized composition of three end members. So in this case, we're plotting only the composition of CO2, water, and sulfur. And in the left hand or the right hand side, it's CO2, sulfur, and hydrogen chloride. Because people have been measuring volcanic gases around the world for over 30 years, we have a general idea of where compositions emitted from related to magmatic activity versus hydrothermal activity plots. Um, and those I've marked by these gray regions. So hydrothermal gases usually plot here, magmatic gases plot on the bottom in both cases. And this is hydrothermal gas composition on the right. Also, in recent years, with these high temporal resolution data sets, we also have an idea of the change in gas composition we'd expect if we have magma ascending from depth. And so I plotted those as these curves. So deep, de deep degassing to shallow degassing would follow this trend on the left-hand side and would follow this trend on the right-hand side. So now I'm going to add our data. The little Sitkin data are plotted as the blue circles, and I've outlined them in red. And you can see that they plot, in both cases, in the hydrothermal region. The CO2 to S ratio, which is a parameter we typically look at, is quite high. It's 15. And our interpretation of this, similar to the presence of no SO2, is that we have hydrothermal scrubbing of a magmatic gas. So to summarize our results and interpretation, we have evidence for shallow water and possibly magma. Uh, the main hazard we might be concerned of is potentially a phreatic eruption if we had magma ascending from depth. Currently, the volcano seems to be in quiescence, so we're not very concerned, but we know this hazard exists. OK, next, moving on to Garaloy. Uh, Garaloy has had persistent degassing throughout all of its historic time, uh, beginning, I think, in the 1700s. It has two summit craters. This is where we showed the video of. This is the fumarole where we were sampling, or the fumarole field. It's had multiple reported eruptions throughout historic time, and one large eruption that occurred in 1929 to 1930. And it's also one of the more seismically active volcanoes that AVO monitors. So at, based on our measurements at Garaloy, we observed a moderate SO2 flux of about 380 tons per day. And our interpretation of this is that we have magma degassing in the subsurface, we have an open vent, and we likely have no hydrothermal scrubbing. Next, if we look at the gas composition, these are shown as the red triangles. So in both ternary diagrams, the Garaloy gas composition plot in the shallow and magmatic gas region. So this suggests that we have shallow magma at Garaloy. And again, no hydrothermal scrubbing. So combining these observations, our interpretation is that at Garaloy, we have shallow magma. Um, an eruption is possible. We need to pay close attention to this volcano, especially paying attention to other data sets where we have 
real-time measurements such as seismicity. Okay, and then next, Canada. Uh, Canada has had six confirmed historic eruptions and five questionable events. Its most recent eruption occurred in 2012, and that produced this fissure that we also showed in the video. Um, this eruption was associated with elevated seismicity and a small ash cloud in addition to the formation of the fissure. Our measured SO2 flux at Canago is about 70 tons per day, so this is in the low region. Our interpretation of this is that we have magma degassing, we likely have an open vent, and there's probably minimal hydrothermal scrubbing. Next, if we look at the gas composition, these, uh, or this single data point is shown as the black diamond. It's shown here in the left-hand ternary and up here in the right-hand ternary. In both cases, it plots in the hydrothermal region. Um, but it also could indicate a deep magma degassing source. So our interpretations of Canada are somewhat ambiguous. Uh, there is evidence for magma. We don't know if it's deep or if there's a hydrothermal system that's scrubbing the SO2 from the gas phase. So this is a volcano we also want to pay attention to. It could become restless and phreatic eruption is a hazard. So again, we want to keep paying attention to our other data sets. Okay, next I'm going to give an example from Readout Volcano. This is in the Cook Inlet, shown here. Uh, Readout has had four confirmed historic eruptions, including the most recent eruption in 2009, and then prior to that, the eruption between 1989 and 1990. Uh, the 2009 eruption was one of AVO's best studied eruptions, and this was also an eruption where volcanic gases played a significant role in forecasting this eruption. So I'm going to show you some of the data from that eruption. So this is from a paper by my colleague Cindy Warner. There's a lot going on this, in this figure, so I'm going to walk you through slowly. On the y-axis, she's plotted emission rate or flux. The blue squares represent CO2. The red diamonds represent SO2. And this black line represents the first magmatic eruption, and the yellow triangles demark the other eruptions that followed. On the bottom, you can see located earthquakes by the Alaska Volcano Observatory. They're each of these gray circles. And you can see that these earthquakes, this is cumulative earthquake number as the black line, you can see that the earthquake number increased up until the eruption. Okay, so what I want to highlight here is that prior to the eruption, oh, I'm sorry, x-axis is date going from October 2008 to October 2010, so this is two years. So what I want to point out is that early in the eruption, we had background levels of CO2 and zero tons per day of SO2. As we get closer to the eruption, so starting in about January, February of 2009, you see the CO2 increases quite significantly, up to over 5,000 tons per day, while the SO2 remains at zero. So here we have a case where we likely have either magma ascending from depth, so we're only seeing the deeply dissolving CO2, or alternatively and probably more likely, is that the SO2 is being scrubbed. Um, readout is a highly glaciated volcano, so it's uh, natural to assume that there's probably shallow water in the edifice. Then what's really interesting is that a week prior to the magmatic eruption, we have the sharp increase in SO2 up to about 5,000 tons per day. So this was a great signal for us that we have magma ascending, drying out the hydrothermal system, and probably a magmatic eruption is coming soon. Um, yeah, and then also it's interesting to note that this same increase in gas emission rate also corresponded with an increase in earthquake number. So this is an example of how we can integrate multiple data sets to more accurately forecast an eruption. Okay, and then lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about Bogoslav. This is our volcano that's currently erupting, and it's located here in the central Aleutians uh, near Unalaska and Dutch Harbor. This is a worldview satellite image of Bogoslav taken on January 31st of this year. Um, Bogoslav is primarily a submarine volcano. Um, the bulk of its volcanic structure is below water. Only about 300 feet is above water. It's had over eight, histor or eight historic eruptions prior to this one. And since activity first began, uh, December 12, 2016, it's erupted explosively about 30 times. Most of these eruptions have uh, produced plumes uh, to altitudes about 20,000 to 35,000 feet. So this is in the region of jet aircraft travel. So we're concerned about these eruptions. Currently, we don't have any on-site monitoring instruments, but we're doing a pretty good job of monitoring Bogoslav remotely. Uh, so some of the monitoring we're, we're monitoring instruments we're using include seismic stations on Umla Umnak and Unalaska Islands, 
Infrasound stations at UMNEC as well as at Sandpoint and Dillingham. Remote sensing using both visible and IR sensors. Lightning, uh, volcanic eruption clouds often produce lightning, so this is a way to detect an eruption. Um, and then satellite observations of SO2. One of the most interesting things about this eruption is we think that the vent has primarily been below the water surface. But there's a couple cases where we think maybe the vent was able to dry out, such as the vent was in the, you know, under the atmosphere, and that has produced different signals in the seismicity, the infrasound, and possibly affecting the gas data. So this is something we're interested in and we're looking into in more detail. Okay, this is a figure made by my colleague Chris Way Thomas at AVO. This shows the edifice of Bogoslav last year, or two years ago, 2015. And this is uh, a figure made based on satellite imagery of December 25th of last year. Here's where we think the vent is. And here is a sequence showing the structure on January 11th, January 24th, and then January 31st. So you can see that the edifice is growing quite substantially, but it's also a dynamic system. There's waves crashing and eroding the volcano as it's being built up. Um, so this is, yeah, an interesting system. And then lastly, because I studied gases, I wanted to show you that um, this has been uh, an eruption that's been detected frequently by satellite, rem satellite remote sensing, in particular infrared sensors, because they're able uh, to measure SO2 during day and night, as well as during the winter when we don't have much UV at high latitudes. So of the 30 eruptions that Bogoslav has produced, about two thirds of them have produced detectable SO2. And this is an example of SO2 detected by the IASE sensor on um, December 22nd of 2016. This produced a mass of about 3.6 kilotons SO2, and this has been the largest SO2 mass released from Bogoslav to date. And the triangle is Sorry, yes, the triangle is Bogoslav. Thank you. And the average altitude of the SO2 cloud is about 30,000 feet, which is consistent with the other observations of the eruption cloud. Okay, so that's what I wanted to talk to you about today. Uh, to summarize, I hope through this presentation you've learned that the composition and flux of volcanic gases can provide useful information regarding the volcano's plumbing system, in particular related to magma ascent, conduit permeability, and hydrothermal scrubbing, and that these observations can help us forecast eruptions as well as estimate the relative explosivity of impending eruptions and therefore better, better mitigate eruption hazards. So thank you very much, and I'll take questions.